All right, welcome everyone to the webinar on how to launch your fintech business in the United States. I am Esther Smith. I work for the Netherlands Consulate General in Atlanta. We opened about a year and a half ago and cover the Southeast region. We are an economic consulate, so really focused on helping Dutch companies do and set up business in the Southeast. Fintech is one of our focus sectors. Um, in fact, we will be launching a virtual fintech platform later this month called Orange Exchange. More on that later. Um, I'm excited to be speaking about this topic with a great panel and I will now introduce them. So first we have Grant Wayne Scott, who is the VP of Ecosystems with the Metro Atlanta Chamber. He leads uh, a team that's create, that creates, retains, and expands technology jobs and investment in the Atlanta region. He focuses on technology, including fintech, international trade, and business development. Charles Potts, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Innovation Officer for the Independent Community Bankers of America, ICBA, Charles has over 35 years experience in financial services. This includes mentoring, starting, co-founding, and leading various fintech startups in digital banking, mobile engagement, financial management, and payments. Most recently, Charles worked at the Atlanta-based incubator, ATDC. Then we have Dr. Recesso, or Art, uh, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at the University System of Georgia. He has served in leadership roles for the New York State Governor's School and Business Alliance Program, the School to Work Program, and many more. He has also co-founded two technology startups and is involved with the Georgia FinTech Academy. And as our fourth panelist, we have Barry Morcillo, who has worked for several FinTech companies, both US and foreign, including Green Sky. He's currently the Senior Director of Sales at Charge After, based in Atlanta. Um, so the topic of this webinar is how to launch your fintech business in the United States. So before we go into kind of the practical matters of setting up and how to do business here, I think it would be good for everyone to get kind of an overview of the U.S. fintech um, sector and the ecosystem, particularly in Atlanta. Uh, you're all based in Atlanta, have a lot of knowledge on Atlanta, and Atlanta, of course, is a major fintech hub. So I'd kind of like to start with that and then move on to some other topics that I think our audience uh, can benefit from. So maybe starting with you, um, Charles, how would you describe the Atlanta fintech scene? Um, exciting, in a, in a okay. singular word. <laughs> One of, the, one of the amazing things that, uh, that Atlanta and Georgia in particular uh, has is a long and deep history in really what was FinTech before FinTech, financial services <clears throat> and, and payments before we really thought about what this FinTech thing would become. We've had a very robust uh, banking system um, a lot of technology companies that come out of the Georgia Institute of Technology that have helped spawn a lot of this uh, innovation that's happened here going back some 30 plus years. And, um, and really uh, a lot of great infrastructure here, not only the, uh, the airport that has allowed us to get uh, anywhere and everywhere we need uh, at a moment's notice, uh, but also a lot of uh, long history in telecommunications and data communications. So the ability to put technology companies in a place where you have an abundant set of infrastructure and resources, really going back to the 80s has, has spawned a lot of great innovation around what we know fintech uh, is today. And, um, and, and everybody on this panel has seen um, a lot of that uh, you know, manifest itself by the companies that have come here and based here. So the history, the, the resources, the ingredients, if you will, to build a really vibrant um, environment for fintech um, ha have been here. The, the roots are deep, and uh, and many of us have uh, have enjoyed being able to uh, to really leverage a lot of that uh, that deep, rich history. Great. Um, I kind of thought of this right now, and I get this question a lot. Why is Atlanta a fintech hub? How did that 
evolve? I know it has something to do with the Federal Reserve, um, but a lot of people are surprised, especially people from abroad. Why did that evolve in Atlanta, not New York or another place? I'll, I'll selfishly say it's because of uh, a lot of the great people we have here, um, mm -hmm. uh, whom are represented here. Um, but we, but, you know, we had, um, we had one of those places, a lot of people don't know kind of the history of, of banking in the U.S., but the unit banking laws that evolved starting in the 1980s allowed a lot of our large regional, super regional, national banks to develop their own um, services, what we would call correspondent banking, and, mm -hmm. and be able to extend those capabilities to smaller banks. So unlike anywhere else in the, in, the, in the world, the United States has one of the most robust, deep, um, multi-tiered banking systems. Um, I happen to be part of the independent community bankers, and so we represent a lot of the small banks. Um, here in the United States, but the Georgia Atlanta ecosystem really created a lot of natural technology uh, that could be extended to a lot of those bankers. And then from that, we, we sat at the center of, of uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure that we could use to run processing centers. And, and then you just kind of fill in the gaps from there and, and start right. building out solutions. Right, right. Thank you. Um, Grant, from your um, role with the Metro Atlanta cha Chamber, uh, you have a lot of experience, as I said in your introduction, um, helping and uh, enticing companies from other states, but also abroad to set up in Georgia and specifically the Metro Atlanta region. What do you think makes Atlanta unique in this sense? And what makes foreign companies specifically want to set up here? Oh, great question. Um, and, and Charles, you know, to, to your point, I'll just, uh, I'll start by saying that the history here really went back to the, to the early 1900s when the Federal Reserve System was set up in the U.S. and we, in Atlanta, got um, a Federal Reserve Bank. And I want to say, Charles Artenberry, it was 1917, 1918, somewhere around there. And our, our Fed became very adept at processing checks um, which we still have to do in the U.S. Um, right. I know that's so foreign to so many of the rest in the world, but Very we still do so, yeah. here. Yeah. Um, and so from there, we really became known as a payments processing center before we really knew what that was. And then, as Charles mentioned, we had this incredible technology wave in the 70s and 80s leading into uh, fiber being laid. And so we, we were really the birth of, of large-scale um, processing data centers. And so inexpensive power, which the South is known for, you know, yeah. large computing power, and now this kind of financial center all created this environment, you know, lower cost of, of wages, lower cost of living, people wanting to come a little bit further South um, for the weather and, and kind of the, yeah. the atmosphere really drove a lot of, of what became known as, as our FinTech and kind of financial services community. So I think I don't know that there's one thing that that solely drives, you know, GDP here and and people want to be here. There's so many things. You know, it's the third largest concentration of Fortune 500s in North America, um, the world's most traveled airport. Although not right now, as you can tell right. by my background, I'm I'm dreaming of days when we can be in Europe again. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I'm not coming to you from Northern Finland, but um, you know. I, you, you have this incredible ecosystem, as Charles mentioned, you know, the university systems, we have 65 colleges and universities just inside Metro Atlanta. And, and for those right. international guests, particularly that may not kind of understand the geography and the political uh, breakdowns, um, in, in the U.S., you have the physical boundaries of a city, the, the corporate or legal boundaries of a, of a city. And then you have a greater kind of, we call it a, an MSA, Metropolitan Statistical Area. So it's really the region. So when we talk about Metro Atlanta, we're talking about 6.4 million people. This is a yeah. huge region, you know, really the capital of the Southeast US. And um, as we like to say, you know, with the world's busiest, most traveled airport in normal times, um, you can get to 80% of the US population with a direct two hour flight from Atlanta. And you can't do that really anywhere else. So you have this ease of travel. You have a very global city. 
um, you know, 70 languages you can hear being spoken at any given time in the region. Um, for the Southeast US, this is the progressive intellectual, um, educational, and certainly cultural center um, for the entire Southeastern US. So it's very welcoming to international visitors, to companies. And I think more than anything, we, we open our doors here, right? We open our Rolodex, we open our, um, we open our, our connections and people will return a call here. They'll return an email. They'll, yeah. they want to help. And, yeah. and I think that's, that's pretty rare when you look at some of the big markets around the country. It is. And I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, we've, we've experienced that as a new consulate, but also in speaking with Dutch companies in particular that, the Southern hospitality is a real thing. And um, it's really pleasant when you're trying to set up a business and especially coming from abroad and everything's new and different and difficult seemingly, but you have a community that wants to help and take some time and introduce you to people. And um, that's, that's really important. So on top of all the, the other specs and uh, costs and, and logistics, I think that's a really important thing. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, um, Art, maybe uh, kind of segueing from what Grant said about the universities, talent, of course, is a huge factor um, for any industry, but also fintech, of course, and it's such a growing industry and, uh, you know, there's new fintech startups, you know, constantly sprouting up in the U.S. and abroad, um, but how do you get the right talent and what is Georgia doing to educate population or to retrain people? Um, how do you see that and what's going on? Well, thank you. Happy to be here with you this morning. And as Grant and Charles have already mentioned, you know, there's such a rich depth to the fintech industry with a long history already here in Atlanta, Columbus, other, other parts of, of Georgia, that you have this knowledge network, if you will, uh, all these subject matter experts, people that are innovating, doing entrepreneurial efforts. Uh, and so you have this very strong local ecosystem of talent development. Uh, Grant mentioned 65 institutions, which I, I hadn't heard. I wasn't, aware, I wasn't even aware of that. That's a, that's a lot uh, nice. it, 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 when you consider the size of the geographic area. And so you have the Georgia Techs and Georgia State, Kennesaws and, and, and other institutions that are locally available. The, the thing that I believe that we've done differently here in Georgia and, and in Atlanta and Columbus specifically is that we've connected that dense local regional network to an entire system statewide. So not only can you walk down the street to Georgia Tech or ATDC or take a, a, a short ride to, to Georgia State or to Kennesaw or UGA, but with the university system and the, the, the Georgia FinTech Academy specifically, we have connected the entire university system. So that's 26 four-year universities to this talent demand need. And because of that, we were able to listen very closely to what the employers valued most in terms of credentials, competencies, and capabilities, and develop a curriculum at a very high quality once, and then make it available to multiple universities. At this point, we have 23 four-year universities offering some kind of credential in FinTech in multiple domain areas because it's cybersecurity, it's IT, it's finance, it's business, it's all of these things. And that's what the employers told us. We need people in, in all of these areas coming to us with a knowledge and understanding and experience in FinTech. And so we were able to develop that not only through the, the university system, but then we also partnered with, uh, most recently, we, we just announced this this past week, uh, a partnership with the Georgia Department of Education, the K-12 system for a deep reach into the high schools. And what's typically mm -hmm. a challenge is that once you get outside the metro area, it, it's a challenge to find people that are subject matter experts that can teach and help design curriculum and you know, even, even offer a seminar. But with this system level approach, what we've been able to do is, is hook up all of the high schools. It's over 500 high schools can now offer a career pathway in FinTech 
They can take dual enrollment courses. So start their uh, college uh, preparation, their college journey towards a FinTech career while still in high school. And I think that that is something uh, that is very unique to, to Georgia. Yeah, they, yeah, definitely. Um, and you alluded to the Georgia FinTech Academy. So in, in short, what, it, what is that? Because I know a lot of people see it on LinkedIn and uh, posts coming by. It, it looks very interesting. How would you describe it? That is a public-private partnership between the entire fintech industry and the entire university system to be crystal clear on the talent needs, uh, the innovation mm -hmm. needs uh, of the fintech industry. Uh, we focus on academic uh, degree and non-degree seeking curriculum in, in talent development, so professional ed, continuing ed, and, and the more traditional degrees, and a heavy focus on experiential learning. Uh, through innovation challenges. And so the, the FinTech Academy serves as a hub, uh, a connector, if you will, between the FinTech industry and the university system to meet those uh, talent and innovation uh, needs. Okay, great. That's, I think, I, to my knowledge, really unique that a state has done that. So that uh, speaks highly of Georgia and, and the sector here and how, you know, public and private institutions are coming together to address this need and a growing industry to really, you know, look beyond what's happening today, but foreseeing what can happen in the future, which I think can help pos position Atlanta and Georgia even further. Um, Grant, maybe quickly back to you. Do you have any experiences uh, on that working with foreign companies? Do they have trouble finding talent? What's their um, take? Or is this what Art just described? Does this really help them with you know, getting up and running and finding the right people. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great asset. And, and I think, you know, all of, all of our major markets around the world are struggling to find enough talent, right? And it's not just finding quantity, it's finding quality and it's finding priced right talent. You know, that's one of the greatest things about having, you know, this, this, this engine of being in the Southeast those, those, you know, more than 60 colleges and universities produce 300,000 students. And so that's, you know, it's not a one college town, you know, it's a 60 plus college town. Yeah, yeah. And then from there, you have this, you know, nine state Southeast US with other major university systems that don't have an economic engine like Atlanta and our fintech ecosystem for Georgia as a whole, you know, because um, Art mentioned Columbus and some of the other, you know, um, big cities in, in Georgia. And you, you have other cities in the Southeast US, Charlotte and Jacksonville and others right. that have financial centers as well. So people know that this is a, you know, a, a place for jobs. So if you're producing in the K-12 and then the collegiate system, you get a natural pipeline for that entry and, and younger talent. But that senior talent, that mid talent, that you need as an international company, right? If you're going to start up in the U S and let's say you want to have a, a sales operation first, right? You, you need a few people, you need a, a market head. Maybe you need a, you know, uh, an, an America's head. Um, you've got to find a senior talent who's been in the ecosystem that understands how to make connections, understands how to find that legal and, and accounting and all the other kinds of helps, you know, knows that they can pick up the phone, and call any of us, you know, on, not just on this webinar, but, you know, the government right. in that rare case where government actually can help, you know, there's, there are all these different layers in, in Georgia um, to, to be able to, to help particularly international companies understand where you need to find and where you can find those connections because you can't just right. import everybody in. No. No. I think I think that's a that, that's a great point, Grant. And I think um, um, you know, look, looking towards you, Barry, I think you've you've had that experience of recognizing that you can you can build a presence right off of the back of uh, the the talent that you can uh, quickly uh, find yeah. here in the marketplace. Yeah, Barry, maybe uh, you can allude to some of your experiences on what they just described in the various fintech companies you've worked for. Well, I mean, I've been fortunate to work for a few, a couple um, uh, with headquarters outside the United States. And I think to build on what the gentlemen have said here, um, uh, they would look to uh, people that are um, embedded here in Atlanta, connected here in Atlanta, 
Um, I think one thing that goes um, perhaps a little bit unseen is the fact that um, it's kind of like the smallest big city in the United States. In other words, we, we don't have to deal with the levels or strata like a New York or a San Francisco uh, in terms of really operating and connecting quickly uh, in every direction, right? So it, it's uh, from that perspective, again, you, things can happen quicker, things can happen a little bit more efficient. Um, and uh, you can get to the people that you would like to probably pretty quicker than you could um, in a massive place like New York City, right? Yeah. And so I think from that perspective, it's advantageous. Uh, again, uh, the panelists mentioned um, the, the educational centers and, and the networks. Um, uh, I also have, a, my wife is from Europe, she's from Poland, and I've also been involved in many professional networking and business development, business economic um, uh, meetings, uh, for example, with a country like that. And it's amazing the connectivity, how quickly you, you find yourself in the embassy in DC or somewhere in Warsaw, like even when you're on vacation. So the connectivity between all foreign countries uh, coming in here to Atlanta is really, really tremendous. And again, um, I think that um, when a senior executive at a uh, foreign-based fintech is looking to put um, talent, and I'll just use my function uh, from a sales leadership perspective. Um, obviously, they know that um, the talents here, uh, not only, again, the university feeders, but um, the, the more fintechs that are here, obviously, the base keeps growing, and the, the networks keep kind of uh, uh, exponentially interacting such that, um, you know, I, just in my own example, I had hired a uh, a very dependable uh, senior salesperson just about a month ago. And it was a very easy process for me because I knew exactly where to go and, and who to tap. Right. Right? Yeah. And so from that perspective, um, it's very easy. But like I said, just to reinforce the less levels of strata here, uh, just make it really amazing. And you know, not to mention all the other advantages of Atlanta. Great, great, thank you. Um, so I think we kind of sketched uh, the scene and what's going on in Atlanta. Um, I'd like to move to kind of the more practical topics. Um, most of our audience is international. So um, just keeping that in mind, when they come to visit the US or now virtually, potentially through our FinTech platform, some of the first questions they'll ask is how to go about this, where to begin, what you know, we want to do business in the U.S. They might have one or two potential clients already, but how to set up, what to do, what to do first, um, and what are the first steps in that process? Anyone who feels like taking this question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me so? um, let, let me let me kind of start the the conversation. Yeah, I've, great. I've had um, I, I've been very fortunate over the last couple of years to work with a number of different what we will call accelerator incubator programs um, and partnering with uh, or working with some foreign national companies that wanted to enter the U.S. market. And when we talk about fintech uh, in general, uh, one of the first real uh, needs for a lot of companies is to really understand the market that they're going to sell to. And, um, and I'll, I'll pick banking as a very narrow piece of that fintech puzzle. Uh, the first thing that, that a lot of companies are challenged by is really figuring out the landscape, figuring out right. the market size, who the players are, how do you address it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the U.S. market when it comes to banking is far more fragmented than anywhere else in the world. Uh, yeah. the different uh, tiers of global, national, super regional, down to community banks and, and, and credit unions presents a lot more opportunities, but it's a, it's a much bigger, uh, broader, fragmented marketplace. So one of the first things that, that I suggest to a lot of companies is come work with, find uh, some of these incubator type organizations. You may be a, a, a seasoned, mature, uh, you know, large company in, in the Netherlands, um, but you really need to figure out what your target market and your market size and audience is. And, and so at, at Georgia Tech, um, and I'll take, uh, I'll take umbrage with the uh, comment earlier about, you know, all these universities in, uh, in the city of Atlanta. There's only one in the city of Atlanta, and that's the Georgia Institute of Technology. <laughs> As a yeah. selfish alumni, I have to uh, 
Sorry, yeah. Art. We um, get it. We get it. <laughs> I also went to Georgia State, so I got to I got to I got to give Georgia State some props as well. But uh, there's a, a great uh, ATDC, great uh, incubator program with a fintech practice and a great set of resources there that can help the companies uh, from the Netherlands find the right talent and people to help them size, assess, and understand, you know, really the, the audience and the opportunity, because that really needs to set the stage uh, before you just start finding bodies to hire and send people over here. Uh, I, 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 I suggest a lot of that market intelligence really needs to be addressed from a FinTech perspective. Because then the second part, and it goes to a good, uh, to a good extent, what, what Barry described, the second part is really then your go-to-market strategy. How are you going to find the, the right talent and resources to help support you going after those different types of market segments? And if you're going after you know, a, a global top 10 bank, that's a different look and feel and skill set and, and, and resume than it is if you're coming into the, the world that I serve as community banks. Um, yeah. and, and so that networking that we have here, uh, the people that, uh, that Esther is going to be talking about, the Orange Exchange, um, and this ability to really find the knowledge and talent. Um, and, you know, then at the other end of the spectrum, Delta's ready when you are. So, yeah. 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 And um, a very practical question that I hear a lot too is, to, mm -hmm. so you recommend to, you know, maybe incubate uh, in Atlanta, get a lay of the land, understand the market. Do you need to have a U.S. entity to do this or how can companies go about this? Maybe Grant? Grant, you want to, you want to? Yeah, sure. Going? Disclaimer, not a lawyer, not a, not no, a we know. Not an accountant, um, although I play one on TV. Um, I think there are a number of ways, you know, to get it done. You can have a simple structured partnership, right? You know, there are, there are, you don't have to be incorporated in a particular state in the U.S. to only do business in that state. I mean, we've got cross, you know, cross uh, state banking laws and there's, you know, lots of regulation in 50 different states. Um, but the, the ease of being able to, to set up some type of an entity here is actually much easier than a lot of people think. And, and with such a big city, you have major global law firms and accounting firms and consultancies that can help you set these up in a matter of you know, days, not months. Um, so I think you really can see the gamut. Uh, and, and we do, when, when we have, and, and I think Charles was the one that mentioned whether you're a you know a, a massive international company or you're five people in a in a, in a small you know we work in in uh, in Amsterdam or anywhere in Europe, um, you can find that you can find that connectivity here and it and it is we do have you know 65 colleges and universities in in Metro although there is only one Georgia Tech um, there there are at each of these institutions and at almost every single level some type of connectivity, whether it's an association, okay. whether it's, you know, a, a membership organization, whether it's meetups, whether it's, you know, faculty and staff that are available for, uh, you know, for projects, whether it's entities like ours, a chamber of commerce, um, everybody is here to try to help make those connections. Um, we're all very familiar with the global market. You know, we have, I think, almost 70 international offices of governments, um, mm -hmm. whether that's a trade office, a consulate, um, there is no one more active, um, and I'll and I will unabashedly say this in front of any of our other you know consulate partners. The Dutch consulate here has been the most active and best connector and most engaged international group we've ever seen in the city. And so, for those of you, you. you know, tuning in today, well, it's true. Uh, you're welcome. It's true. Um, you have that connectivity, right? That's why we're all he here is to make sure that. Um, you have connections, whether it's capital, whether it's a university, whether it's, yeah. you know, a, a team incentives, and you know, we'll get to a lot of these other topics a little bit later on, but, uh, you know, you yeah. get one of us, you get all of us. Right? Yeah, that's great. You mentioned um, a few things there, incentives. Um, are there any particular incentives in Georgia, in Atlanta for startups, fintechs, um, from abroad? What, you know, I know there's a lot 
perhaps, but could you maybe highlight some things that would be available potentially? Sure. Well, and, and it really depends on uh, so many factors. In Georgia, we have statutory or, or incentives that are written into law. So it's very clear, you know, once you know where to find the information. And again, that's, you know, why, why a lot of us on, on this panel exist is to, is to help you make those connections. But there are, there are uh, tax credits to start, you know, uh, R&D projects. There are tax credits for making this uh, your North American headquarters, your, your U.S. headquarters. There are tax credits for um, new jobs created. Um, I think the difference in the U.S. market and a lot of our European countries, in a lot of European markets, you'll have startup grants and you'll have, you know, it could be a, 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 a national government or a city government. Government um, could be a public-private partnership. That's a little less common here because of the volume. Um, you know, we've got I don't know four, four or five thousand startups at any given time just in Metro Atlanta, um, and hundreds in kind of the financial services, fintech, you know, um, uh, insure tech, and all of our pieces of kind yeah. of the banking ecosystem. Um, so, some municipalities, maybe it's a city, the city of Atlanta, or maybe it's the city of Alpharetta, or you know, an actual city inside the region might have some some physical dollars, but that's pretty rare in the U.S. What we provide instead is you know things that you can't find anywhere else, and that is, that's that connectivity, the connections. You can have free office space and a twenty-five thousand dollar check from anybody, but if you can't sell a single thing here, you're going to burn through that like that. Right. Or if you're in San Francisco, yeah. you're going to burn through it in a week. So yeah. you have to you have to find customers. That's what we do. Yeah. We help you find customers. Yeah, good point. Good point. And um, kind of sticking on the topic of um, money and financials, um, finding capital and funding. Um, I know that could be a whole webinar in itself. But um, you know, coming from abroad, companies, startups particularly, might have some funding from the country they they originate from. But how what options are there for finding more capital in the U.S.? Is that commonly done or is it still difficult? And what does, you know, the landscape for that in the Southeast look like? I don't know if anyone I'll, has a particular I'll, thought. I'll, I'll take a start at that. Uh, yeah. So so we have, um, really to, to Grant's point, there there's this public-private set of relationships that are out there. So there, there are um, different types of incentives. There may be some capital uh, for uh, particularly targeted types of activity. So say, for example, in the city of Atlanta, um, there, there are some programs targeting some investment capital around some financial literacy uh, types of initiatives. Um, there, there are then a wealth of the traditional capital sources, angel networks, um, seed capital investors, venture capital, um, all the way up to structured investment banking, um, you know, serious uh, capital, um, public capital as well. The, the opportunity and or challenge is really to Grant's point, and that is, is building those initial connections coming into the market um, and getting the introductions to the right people and real quickly you'll find it opens up a lot of doors. And that's the, uh, the, the comments that I think Barry and Grant made earlier is the networking that takes place uh, really moves a whole lot faster in this marketplace and getting companies introduced to those right sources. And a lot of that work can take place well before somebody makes kind of the first uh, you know, formal uh, visit into the U.S. Um, and in the fintech space specifically, there are a lot of, um, a lot of different programs. Uh, again, whether it's an early stage startup company, there's incubators and accelerators and seed capital and, and angel capital associated with those. And then the larger mm -hmm. uh, companies, the larger enterprises, you're, you're getting into more of the tax credit, the more of the public oriented uh, capital uh, availability to, to spawn um, investment relocation and establishment of a presence in, in a particular geographic uh, area like Georgia. Right. 
but you think um, are investors open to foreign startups? You know, they, they might be incubated at Georgia Tech. Are they, is there still a hurdle there or do you think there's no, so, no issues? So I, I, I represent uh, an accelerator program that we built for community banks here in the United States. And our remit is to go out and find the best solutions anywhere. And in the last yeah. few years, we brought companies into the U.S. from six different countries. Uh, we've started taking applications this year for uh, for our next cohort, and um, and we've got we've got um, applications already from about eleven or twelve different uh, different countries. Um, I'm actually I, I just got off a call earlier this morning. Esther hadn't even had a chance to share with you. I'm. I'm helping one of our partners that supports the Georgia FinTech Academy, um, FIS, who's one of the large fin global FinTechs, got a large presence here in Atlanta. They're a, they're a big employer. They're, a, uh, they're a, you know, a, a major player in this space and they're running their own accelerator program. And we're working with the Dutch company called Surfly um, and bringing them into the US uh, to help them uh, you know, bring their solution from Amsterdam uh, into the US. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, good to hear. Yeah, Good. so there's that that exists. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. That's places. yeah. That's that's good to know. I know that's always on uh, startups' minds, especially coming from other countries, how to go about that here. And maybe um, you mentioned customer, or both of you mentioned customers, connections. Barry, um, you've worked for various fintech companies in sales roles. How do you, you know, how do you suggest? companies go about that when they're new in the US? Like how should they plot out this, you know, sales strategy? Well, it's a great question. And uh, uh, I'm always looking at it through the lens of yes, uh, right? So uh, brand awareness, obviously customer acquisition are, are top of mind. Um, but when working for an uh, organization that is based in London or Tel Aviv, like I have in terms of various fintechs, um, I can't stress enough to those uh, CMO colleagues of mine uh, in terms of, of quickly building the most relevant um, media connectors, right? Subject matter expert connectors, um, uh, practitioners, uh, anybody in the ecosystem that um, is going to obviously not just benefit from solution, but, but look to be on the cutting edge of covering innovative fintech uh, models, approaches, um, such that by the time a sales team is in place uh, with a small startup from another country, um, the air cover more or less has been established such that if you're going to go against some, some entrenched competitors in the United States, um, the word's already out that, um, you know, you've got a value proposition that obviously um, uh, is uh, uh, highly viable. And, and of course, the quicker you can get a, a couple um, very, very large customers uh, to, uh, to talk about those case studies and those uh, success examples, yeah. the better. But, but I can't stress enough the, the, the brand awareness approach. Um, it sounds age old and like it's been around, but you'd be surprised how many people kind of forget how important that is and just jump right into the sales engagement. And uh, I, while they're both important, like I said, I, I, I tend to stress um, and even work with, with those uh, uh, executives at my companies um, to um, share the, the network that I've built to say, look, these may be the best starting points. So again, I, I just always a, a multiple prong approach, but uh, starting with awareness just never goes out of yeah. style, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Can I just add to that? Definitely, yeah. I think, I think we've got a great example, you know, in, in, in our partners at Payments and Cards Network. You know, this is, this is a brand that, that came on the ground, you know, we met at Money 2020. Um, and that, that's another thing that when you have these global events or FinTech South that's coming up here in, you know, in, in a month, when, when you have the ability to connect first, as Barry mentioned, and, and start to know your market and, and start to, to be that thought leader, you know, Payments and Card Network hit the ground running. You know, we got them on panels to be seen as thought leaders. Um, they, were, they were volunteering in the community you know, they were in articles, um, they were working to help us, you know, they opened doors that we couldn't even open in our own city, which was right. incredible to, 
depth of their relationship. So I think it's really that two way street when you can add value to a market, the market wants to help add value back to you. And so getting engaged early and then staying engaged. Once you open, it's even more important that you're constantly in front of, and not all, I mean, you're always in sales mode, but it doesn't have to look like sales mode and it can look like partnership mode and, and that's critical. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Um, yeah, um, maybe moving to a few last questions before we open it up to um, the Q&A just in general, do you, any of you, maybe Art, start with you, have any lessons learned from your experience in startups and starting a company in the FinTech space that you would like to share with the audience? I, I, I did, uh, personally, I did two startups, not in the FinTech space, but within the mm -hmm. Georgia system. And I found it to be an incredible experience from, uh, and I did this, from uh, initially from within the university system, uh, developed an idea, created an, an invention, and then was able to bring it into a university system incubator, but then also was through the network. And I think this is what Grant and Charles were getting at earlier, is that to me, one of the, when you're starting a company and you're at this early stage and you think about the effort that it requires to try and find the people that can coach you and help you and whether that's in sales or trying to figure out a business plan or build a pitch deck, I found that very easy to do personally and just found the assets not only from within the institution that I did this work, which was at the University of Georgia, but then I was quickly connected into uh, uh, the ATDC, uh, and then also, uh, David Cummings work, uh, at, um, Atlanta Tech Village. Atlanta Tech Village, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Sorry. Brain fade this morning. Uh, but, uh, and so that quickly got me into an additional ecosystem and then the Atlanta Tech Angels and it just it ballooned into I ended up getting access to people who had been uh, very successful at say you know sales and marketing and in the early stages of Cisco when it was a startup I don't know you know I can't imagine being anywhere else and getting access to those kinds of people who were willing to give of their time for a cup of coffee essentially uh, and help us grow that company. Uh, so, and, and then we were able to access uh, venture capital, not only through the Georgia Research Alliance, but uh, through private sectors. Uh, so I, you know, my personal experience was a good one. And I found Atlanta uh, and the metro area to be a place where there was just a lot less friction involved with trying to get access to the people who could help me, coach me, uh, which ended up creating customers. Yeah, I, I would just, I would add to that. I mean, I, piggybacking on that and then something you know, Barry said earlier, I've been fortunate to uh, work at building companies that have gone international and entered new markets and help companies enter the U.S. market. And there's this force multiplier effect of finding the right talent in that market, uh, finding somebody like Barry who can help you build out your organization in the U.S. is probably the, one of the critical first steps. Because right? you, right. you, really, you really need, in fintech, you're competing against global players every day of the week. And you're competing at a at a pace and speed that is just scary fast nowadays. So the need for any company entering a new marketplace um, is to move quickly, efficiently, and effectively. And that starts with finding the right talent that knows the landscape, um, can keep you from touching that proverbial third rail, mm -hmm. um, and knows when to say no and keeps you focused. Otherwise, you know we're we're a we're a huge market entering Georgia and entering the U.S. This is a massive market and, um, and you can wander around in the woods <laughs> lost um, if you're, if you're uh, not focused in, uh, in, in finding that right 
uh, partnership and people. And that's ultimately the biggest asset we have in Atlanta and in Georgia is just some amazing right. talent, amazing people who are willing to give them their time to, to help you navigate what we're doing here. And that's, yeah. for, you know, yeah, that's really important. I yeah. was going to say, Graham? you know, we want to be realistic too. you know, running a business is hard enough on a good day, let alone entering a new market. So, you know, it's not always all roses and money just falling from the ceiling that you can grab. No. You know, this is, yeah. this is hard work, right? And, and it is. it's even more important when you are going to look at a new market like the U.S. that you find a spot that allows you a little bit of breathing room, right? Mm -hmm. That your, your pressure to pay the bills, right? Your rent costs, your staff costs, your cost of living, um, having to get on a plane to go anywhere, all that chips away at the time you you have to develop and sell and the if you can find some place like you know like Georgia where you can land and take a breath and say okay you know this I have a plan I'm gonna get plugged in now I've started my brand awareness you know I would argue that that's going to give you a lot more flexibility than the pressure of being in some of the the the, the very large and very expensive markets yeah um, and I think yeah. that's a great you know it's a when when we look at Europe you know, I think that's one of the things that makes, um, you know, the Netherlands such an, uh, such an amazing place to be, a, uh, you know, a landing pad because we're working to help our companies here in Georgia, you know, go to Europe and, and go to other markets. So to be able to have that kind of cross-border relationship and understand, you know, the connections between our airports and our ports, all of the, you know, Schiphol and, and right. uh, you know, right. Rotterdam and all of these yeah. really major entities, um, that's critical. Yeah, it is. Um listening to all of you, I hear connections, very important, ease of doing business, finding a place that's easy and comfortable and uh, hospitable to do business, um, plotting out your market strategy and customers. And then we didn't really go into the legal and regulatory space, but um, as Charles alluded to, the U.S. is very fragmented. There's a lot of potential due to that because there's so many banks, so potential customers, but also you know, the differences between all these institutions and the state laws and the federal laws and things like that. So that's all things to keep in mind. But I think if you land in a place where you have a good network with people who, you know, know the ropes, have been around the block and can kind of guide you in those first steps, it can really make it a lot easier. Um, so good. Thank I, you I, for pointing I, I like that out. I like to remind everybody our, our very first uh, radio station, TV station here in, uh, in Atlanta is called, is, uh -huh. is call sign is WSB, which stands for Welcome South, brother. Um, and it is a very uh, accommodating yeah. environment here. And, uh, yeah, I didn't Perfect. know that. Yeah. Great trivia. <laughs> How do I not know very that? Good. Very good. Very <laughs> good. It's amazing. <laughs> Wow. Maybe one last question before the Q&A, and this can also be very elaborate, but let's try to keep it short. What specific opportunities do you see in the U.S. market in the fintech space for foreign companies? Is it, you know, in the area of payments, user experience? Where do you think um, there is specific opportunity or is it just a matter of coming in and doing it better and more efficiently? So I'm taking applications for our next accelerator program at the ICBA, and I need big data, data analytics, risk management. Um, that's that that is top of mind for banks here in the U.S. Um, we we uh, we we love those ideas, and we welcome any and all. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. <laughs> is that does everyone concur, or is anything? I, w I would say that. to build on that, yet yeah, certainly uh, AI related technologies that kind of build on what Charles is saying. And, uh, you know, one area, look, we it, it, almost in every technology category, right? It seems like the B2C is the big shiny object and that's where everybody builds the models around to go grab that and for good reason. But I think um, the B2B e-commerce sector um, is one that is still got a lot of growth to it. Um, I personally okay. uh, have seen over the last nine months, um, entire organizations, for example, in a place like Silicon Valley, looking at Atlanta to, to move the entire company to the Atlanta market for all the reasons that we talked about today, right? Um, the viability, the networks, the cost of living, the education, um, I, I just the, the, the banks, the, it just, it's incredible what's happening. But I think 
Um, there are just a lot of areas in B2B that um, are a little bit still nascent, but, but growing like a weed. And I think we're going to see in the next couple of years uh, that B is as popular as B2C, just my two cents. Thank you. Good, good. I hadn't he heard that one before specifically, so good. All right. Well, thank you all for your insights. Um, I want to go to a few questions. A lot came in. I think some we already uh, maybe covered. Um, but for example, um, what is commercial real estate like for startups? We are looking for a 10 to 30 person space. I see mainly major corporate real estate skyscrapers. So I'll, I'll take that if, if you want. And actually, we just, yeah. you know, we just got a message from a good friend, Chad Koenig, um, who's with Cushman and Wakefield. You know, we, we, have, we have the expert, the real estate expertise here to really help you look at, um, at all different areas. And yes, there's a, there's a ton of skyscrapers here. That's, you know, part of where the 6.4 million people work. Um, but when you do that, you get that density, which allows then the urban and the exurban areas to have, you know, a, a, a huge depth of um, small office space, co-working spaces, and you know, Chad would know better better than I would. But you know, I I think at this point we have somewhere around, and we'll see after you know post pandemic. But we had somewhere around sixty independent um, locations of of just co-working spaces. You know, we've mentioned ATDC, we've mentioned Atlanta Tech Village. Um, we also have an incredible. Um, HBCU, Historical Black Colleges and Universities, um, yeah. a diverse educational, um, you know, ecosystem and network, um, helping founders of color and helping, you know, women founders and, and, and a very inclusive environment. And you find, you find people congregating around common, not just verticals, but common kind of social issues. And, and that's something you really can only find in a, in a, in a Metro Atlanta market, a Georgia market. So absolutely, um, I will guarantee you it's going to be far cheaper than, you know, London or New York or San Francisco or Seattle or Toronto. Yeah. Um, you can find it here, I promise you, millions and millions of square feet. Right, good, that's good to know. Um, then the next is from Miriam Nas. <clears throat> My FinTech company has local investors in the Netherlands. Can you say something about how U.S. or Atlanta investors partner or collaborate with for, foreign VCs? Is it generally a friendly collaboration? Never had dealing with, never dealt with U.S. VCs, so would like to know what to expect. Any thoughts on that? Question again, Esther. <clears throat> yeah, the question is, um, this is from a Dutch company. Can you say something about how U.S. investors partner or collaborate with foreign VCs? Um, so we actually we we actually have a, a couple of uh, VCs in Atlanta who have done um, done deals internationally, um, done deals with other international portfolio companies. Um, typically. Um, if there is a foreign VC that is looking to invest in a U.S. entity, uh, those partnerships are pretty straightforward um, and pretty easy to accommodate. Um, I, I, we, okay. we have a very we have a very broad venture capital uh, you know ecosystem in, in the U.S. So it, it's right. I mean, it's a matter of networking and finding the right connectors. Yeah. So those collaborations you do see and generally can work out. I know maybe good to mention in October, there's a big conference, Venture Atlanta, with many VCs, which will also be virtual. So anyone tuning in today, uh, they can sign up for that and partake in a virtual manner and meet some of these VCs here in the US. <clears throat> One more question. Uh, with COVID and the social justice protest and the election in the US, these are unstable times. We were getting ready to lease our office in Atlanta in March and now do not know when to return. Can you guys give any predictions as to when it's smart for me to come back? Any thoughts on that? Who wants get to my crystal, get my crystal ball yeah. out here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Art, Art, what are you seeing from like the FinTech Academy and the university system first and foremost? That's probably a good indicator. Oh, 
Well, <laughs> I, I would, uh, I'd probably defer that uh, a response to that question to, yeah. to uh, someone else on the panel. I, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that, uh, that I could comment on that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I will say just in general, I mean, we're, we're starting to see some of the offices open up and people uh, coming back into the buildings in Midtown. Um, right. I mean, it's, it, it, it is, it is slowly opening up. It's, um, it's measured. It's, uh, it, people are taking very, uh, very cautious steps with inside the guidance that both the city and the state and the federal government have established on, on the right kind of um, so, social distancing and, and safe practices. Um, I, I, I think it's going to depend upon the appetite of, uh, of some of the companies themselves on, you know, just how much space they need and how well they could, uh, you know, accommodate people in a, in a safe social distancing right. environment for the near term. Yeah. I, yeah, you are seeing some companies phase back into this. I know we are even moving into a new office that will have much more space where it will be possible to socially distance. So a lot might depend on that. And of course, the travel restrictions are more on a federal level and also pertain to Americans wanting to enter the, the EU. So it's difficult currently both ways. Um, maybe a last question, which is actually kind of for me, but uh, someone is asking, is the Dutch government also partnering with other US cities? My business is more focused on Latin America and Miami. Uh, the answer to that is yes, we are. Um, we work as a network. Um, so we have consulates in various uh, US cities on the West Coast, East Coast, of course, our embassy in DC, and we have a consulate in Miami. We work very closely. So if you reach out to one of us, but you're a better fit somewhere else in the US, we'll you know, guide you in the right direction and um, help you either way. To that point, uh, I wanted to allude a little bit to Orange Exchange. That is our virtual FinTech platform, which we'll be launching this month. It will be an online community where Dutch FinTech companies, startups mainly, can meet with the Atlanta-based ecosystem and network, which was all described in this webinar today as being very valuable, very helpful. So we think this can be a great way to connect both sides uh, to each other, especially in these times where traveling is almost impossible. Um, and in that platform, we hope to provide information, um, stimulate connections, and for uh, mentoring opportunities. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to me or some, some of my colleagues at the consulates, and we're uh, happy to elaborate on that. Um, there's more questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to those. Um, but thank you to our panelists for all your insights. And of course, thank you to PCM Payments and Cards Network based in Amsterdam, but with an office, their US headquarters in Atlanta. They've been a great partner to us as a consulate as well. And they've graciously offered to set up this webinar. So look forward to collaborating again in the future. Um, thank you. And for any other questions, please reach out to me or anyone, I guess, on the panel. I'm offering your uh, your insights and expertise and uh, hope to see you in Atlanta. Thank you, Esther. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you so, much. so much. Thank Esther. you, everybody. For Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.